This is Political Radar Pulse with Rhonda Sitnikau, where we explore the issues facing Northeast Wisconsin and beyond with insightful interviews and open discussions. Hey, all you political junkies, welcome to Political Radar Pulse, the best 30 minutes of unscripted and uncensored political talk you will hear all day. Joining me via Skype is Wisconsin State Senator Roger Roth. He represents District 19, which is composed of parts of Outagamie and Winnebago County. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. So you recently proposed with um, a, a few other legislators a pair of bills that would prevent owners of big box retail stores from lowering their property tax assessments, um, otherwise known as the dark store theory. And um, you're looking to do something about that. Um, can you tell us why, how you arrived at that and what the bills entail? Sure, I'd be glad to. Appreciate you having me here. It's an important issue. I want to give a shout out to a couple of folks, Representative Rob Brooks and Senator Dewey Strobel, who have also worked very closely with the other authors, co-authors of this legislation. So we've been working very closely since the beginning of this year, January of this year, on this issue. And I got to tell you, this is something that was brought to me by my local government officials. And it's something that had they not reached out to me, had people on the town boards and city councils um, and the, the village boards across my district not gotten in touch with me and talked to me about how dark stores were affecting the, the changing the assessing model, how that was affecting their local municipalities, uh, I would not know about this issue. So I applaud all of those individuals in my district and across Wisconsin who have worked closely with other legislators to bring this important issue to the forefront. What really has happened in Wisconsin is that a lawsuit in 2008 uh, left, kind of changed the door, or opened the door a little bit on changing the way we assess property here in our state. And we have instances in my district up in Green Bay, actually all across Wisconsin, where, where different businesses are looking to exploit the loopholes created because of this lawsuit and they're challenging their assessments. And to the reason we call it dark stories, what they're doing is they're saying, you know, I want you to value my business that's up and running currently right now, successful in this part of town. I want you to value the footprint of my business the way the same value is the dark vacant store on the other side of town. And that's why they call it the dark store bill. Unfortunately, when you do that, you're not taking into account many different factors, including location, and what that value factors into the property. Now, I got to tell you, at the forefront, you know, we could list the different cases and different businesses who are who are using these loopholes. But I got to tell you that uh, I don't, um, you know, I don't want to be critical of them for what they're doing in this sense. I think everybody, I'm a property owner, I own a house in Appleton, many of your viewers own property across Northeast Wisconsin. All of us, when the assessor comes through, I mean, all of us, we want to pay the lowest amount of tax. So we want to go and, you know, when my assessor comes through and, and your other, it's common for people to challenge assessors and want to make sure that they're paying the lowest amount of taxes. So I totally understand businesses coming through wanting to make sure that they're paying the minimum amount of taxes that they have to pay. I don't, I don't have a problem with them doing that. My issue is that when they come in because of this change in the way we interpret assessing in our state, when they come through and want their business valued the same as the business on the other side of town that's dark and has been vacant for a number of years, that's where I have a problem because when you allow that practice to happen, what ends up happening for the municipalities is they tax, there's three separate classes of property that gets taxed. There's the residential, which would be all residential homes, duplexes. There are uh, the industrial, which would be your factories. And then there's the commercial, which would be your big box retailers and others. When those on the commercial side fight their assessments and do what I believe because of this court ruling is not the way we intend property to be valued, when they bring this dark store model of valuation in and lower their assessments, the municipalities, whatever one you live in, 
They, they have to pay their bills. They still have to plow the roads. They still have to make sure the streetlights are working. They still have to pay for police and fire. So when it goes down on one side, it's got to go up on the other. And that's what we're trying to prevent here is a tax shift from the commercial side of real estate assessment to the residential side. We're not going to talk much about the industrial side because that's happened at the state level. That's that is all assessed at the state level and, and really doesn't play into this picture. Uh, can so I can I make a mention to something though? Absolutely. I mean, um, so in, can we also include schools in this as well? Schools are affected by this. When this happens, these tax assessments decline. That schools are also affected. Absolutely. Anything related to property tax, anything that's based off property taxes. Um, would be affected by this. So, um, so what we're trying when we're stepping in here, what we're trying to say is that we want to go back to what status quo was before the state Supreme Court ruling in 2008, and that's what our bills seek to do. So, the one that I'm specifically pushing through is the dark store bill, and that deals with it makes it so you cannot. You know, we define what dark store, what dark property is. We define, we define what it means to be vacant, um, and we also make sure another practice that that these businesses will do is say they're up and running on one side of town. So you got big box store A has got a thriving business for the last 20 years on one side of town, but demographics change, and what was hot on one side of town that might not be the hot real estate market in 20 years and you find that through development and so forth it's now shifted over to this side of town so this box store a shuts down their business relocates over to the other side of town and becomes big box store b and they and they put a deed restriction on that old box store meaning that nobody can come into that box store and compete in the same kind and like business that they had there before and and there's still one so my well, I'm glad you on. mentioned that because that really does put cities, towns, villages, other municipalities, it holds them hostage for tax revenue. Be- and, and the reason being because assessors are supposed to assess the value of property to its highest and best use. That's what they're supposed to tax it to. And if you put a deed restriction in there, now you really can't tax it to its highest and best use because the deed restriction limits what they can use that business for. So because it limits what they can use that business for, it drives down the value that that property would have. So when these companies, I'm sorry, when these companies come in to um, these cities, villages, to do proposals in regards to their development, they, they walk in with a very different story, right? I mean, these, these cities, these city councils, these village boards, they're actually approving of proposals that look very different than, let's say, even a year or two later. Um, in regards uh, without, to the tax proposal. Yeah, without, uh, uh, without uh, well, let me just say this. You have businesses who, who this, this kind of gets to the hypocrisy. And we're going to be having a hearing soon in the Capitol where I'll be bringing down the locals just from my district. And they'll be telling the stories firsthand. It's one thing for me to say it. When you got the mayors and the town board chairman and so forth sitting down there telling how this actually impacts their district. I am so glad to hear you say that. Can I just yeah. interrupt you for a second? Because I feel sure. like I have, to some degree, I have a city council that I've spoken to in the last 24 hours that are somewhat apathetic to this issue. And it is, I am so glad you said that. Carry on. Go on. Yeah. So we've got businesses. And again, I don't fault the businesses for trying to whatever the the law is and how it's being interpreted, I don't I don't fault them for trying to pay the least amount of taxes. I don't. All I'm saying is I want to bring certainty back to the assessment process and take the assessors are supposed to assess through practices that are already established by the Department of Revenue. We want to take that assessor's manual and take a few of those provisions in there and lift that and put it into state statute so it has a little higher legal ground when it, when, it, when it goes to court to be challenged. And we just want to bring certainty back to the process. We've got instances where, where businesses, they fight their assessments and they get the number of what they're paying down, you know, almost in some cases in half. And then they go and they sell their business a year or two later for twice what their assessment was. And it actually, what they sell it for is almost in line with what 
the municipality wanted to value it at previously. But so they're really they they're the truly court. gaming the taxpayer in this dark horse theory, dark they horse, are, dark store theory. They're gaming them. Yeah, they are trying to pay the, the the least amount of taxes. And again, I don't fault the, the the trouble we have right now here. It's not that they're doing anything wrong because of the court case. What they are doing has legal precedent behind it. That's why we are coming in as a legislature and saying, regardless of the state Supreme Court opinion, we want to lay down in statute how we will treat dark and vacant property in the assessment process. And by doing this, we will bring certainty back to, to our assessors and we will make sure that it's valued in line with how we've always traditionally done it. So in the court it, ruling of 2008, how do you, you think that happened? Why do you believe that it, that even was the situation was even happening in the first place? How did we arrive at that court ruling in 2008? Uh, it's a very interesting court ruling. Um, it dealt with one of the, one of the box retailers was challenging their assessment and I think there was some misunderstanding, to be quite honest with you, I think it's, it's very complicated. I think there was a misunderstanding and um, in, under, in understanding how the assessment process worked, I think some had thought, and some still do will say this, thought that businesses are assessed by the profits that they make. Now I will tell you, there's three different ways that assessors assess property. There's the compare, sales comparison approach, and that's where you assess a building based on what it sold for recently or what other buildings similar to it have sold for recently. There's the cost approach where you go and you value the bricks and the sticks and the components of the construction and the value of the property. You put add all that up, what it would cost to build that building and the value of the property. That's the cost approach. And then the third is called the income approach. And here's where I think there's a little ambiguity out there in what brought about this court case. In, through the income approach, you value property, you can value property by the income the property generates, not by what the, the, the dollars and cents that come into the store, if the store is doing great business, they don't get their property tax, isn't based on how well the business is, do, is doing, it's based on what the market rent is for that building compared to market rent for like or similar properties in the area. So that really is what started it. That's what the court case, um, um, it made it really so that you couldn't value property. You couldn't use the lease, the lease backs in the valuation of property. And you took that component out from it. And from that started the process that you see here happening in our state. What we are looking to do through both of these bills is to one, absolutely allow assessors to use the value of leases when it comes to valuing property. And I, I explain it to people this way. If you have anyone out there who rents property, I rented property growing, I own my house now, but if there was a time I rented property. When I was in college, I rented a property by my college town. Uh, when I got a little older, I moved, when I was uh, moving back to Appleton after college, I got a nicer duplex. You pay your lease oftentimes determines the value of that property. The higher the lease is, the more value that property has. And my old college apartment, I can attest, it wasn't the best and I didn't have to pay much for it either. But that's why that's one of the ways we can value property is using the income approach, valuing the leases. And we we're, we're wanna make sure that, that assessors have that tool available to them. Question for you. Um, so you mentioned college town. So, you know, we look into, I think it was in the last two years, Marquette, Michigan, they had a situation and Marquette is the home of Northern Michigan University. They have literally their, their economic impact is really mostly based off of that school. Um, so there's, you know, the school taxes as well, um, or the, you know, buildings that are in their um, businesses that come up because of the students there and whatnot. So they had a situation where Lowe's, decided instead of $64 a square foot or $1,000 a square foot, it was 25. So their tax assessment dropped dramatically and their services suffered dramatically. And I think I'd mentioned to you prior to taping that the, the local library had to actually dig in their pockets to make up the difference for some of the, the services like the 911 and the search and rescue services and, and their mental health and, um, you know, school district services how did that happen? Because it's not a very large 
town. It's really um, not very yeah. large at all. But yet here we have this, you know, this store that decides to to do this and they were successful and it's they suffered for it. So if you, my district, the 19th Senate District, Appleton, Needham, and Asha, the surrounding townships, if you drive from Green Bay to Milwaukee or Madison via Interstate 41, you're going to drive, you know, all the, you'll see all the commercial property there. It impacts my district when, when one of these stores challenges, and many of them do, and they've been winning, when they challenge and win these, these assessments because of this court precedent, it has an impact on our locals. But our tax base is, is large enough that it's not as severe. It's still, it still is an impact, uh, in, but it's not as severe as it would be when you talk this instance in Marquette, Michigan, or I even have examples around Wisconsin. What's really tragic is when you take that town or that village, which has like one main store, maybe they have one big box store or, or one larger facility like you mentioned there with the university. When you have one large commercial enterprise like that, and they challenge, the entire town oftentimes is, that makes up so much of the revenue that they spend that, that it impacts them worst of all. Which is why if you look at the individuals who have signed on to this bill, Republicans and Democrats, very bipartisan from across Wisconsin, it's not just the big cities, it's the small towns, everybody understands how important this is in bringing certainty back to the valuation process, especially those representatives from the rural areas who've experienced exactly what you're talking about. So let's let's also mention it's bipartisan, but it's also nonpartisan, right? Because a lot of local governments, that's their nonpartisan. This is really a, a math game and something that is about quality of life and that uh, people need to to really and truly start paying more attention to it because it's not, I don't believe it's getting enough um, airtime, um, the risks involved. Uh, let's, can we go to the, the it's, this is local, it's a little closer to us, but the Menards versus the village of Howard. Um, so is this, this legislation that you're proposing, um, it looks like their trial because Menards is suing the village of Howard because they want lower tax assessments. Is that going to play into their favor if, the bill goes through. Um, walk us through how that will work, if it will matter at all. Ron, I don't know the, the specifics in enough detail for that particular uh, instance to comment on it, but I will tell you this. With the bills that we are looking to bring through, we're going to bring certain assessors right now, they don't know what to do. So they're going out there, they're valuing the building for you know using the cost approach i've got instances where where again buildings were just built in the last year so you absolutely know what the cost of the materials were they know what they paid for the land they know all this they're being challenged in court their assessments are being knocked down these things are sold a couple of years later far more than they were assessed for so these they don't really know what to do they're trying to use a sales comparison approach but then they go and they compare it to like property. Now they're being challenged because they should have compared it to this dark vacant store that hasn't had any pulse in the last five years. So these guys, they really don't know what to do. What, what we are doing in these bills is we're bringing certainty back to the assessing practice. And we're not, cha- we're not bringing anything new to the state that we haven't already had. We just want to go pre-2008 and allow, lift some of the Department of Revenue appraisal practices and put those in state statutes. But here's how it will affect instances like what you were talking about. I've heard from people saying that now businesses will be held hostage. That is absolutely not the case. They will still absolutely have the right to challenge their assessment in court. And if they feel that there is an assessor out there who has gone rogue, and is valuing it far, far higher than what the market rate is, they will absolutely have a way to go to court and challenge it based on the statutes in the, the playing field that we are going to establish. Again, going pre that court case. So as it relates to pending court cases or ones that could come up, they uh, the pending court cases will absolutely be affected by, by how we, you know, if these laws pass. But I want people to know that businesses still will be able to challenge their assessments. We are not looking to raise taxes on businesses. What we want to make sure is that is that every class of res- of property in our state that it's assessed appropriately. And I would tell you that um, 
you know, individuals are saying that these guys are trying to raise taxes on businesses. I want to tell you and your listeners, we are absolutely not looking to pay to raise taxes on anybody. We want to make sure that commercial commercial entities, businesses, that they can unfairly, in my opinion, lower the values of their properties, forcing residents to have their taxes increase. Well, that's a dangerous that's precedent, cool. right? I mean, it really could be for other companies and businesses that are in this, the area. I mean, it's like, what's why not? You know, it's fair. I mean, it, it starts well, to create a problem that way. Right. If we do not do this, that is exactly what's going to happen. It's starting already. You're, I'm seeing in my district, you're seeing it in Green Bay, we're seeing it across Wisconsin. But once they realize, once other businesses realize that they have a tool in place to lower their assessments, everyone is going to go there. Right. And the end result is going to be higher residential property taxes. Now, again, I'm not faulting right now businesses trying to employ every tool they can to lower their taxes. I just, we just as a state need to come in and let people know that this is how we're going to assess property and, and put that certainty out there so that everybody, that, that it's fair for everybody. We shouldn't have all of the tax revenue coming to local municipalities or the majority lion's share of it come from the residential side. So are you pretty oh, comfortable with your support on this bill or these bills? I, I noticed the governor hasn't taken a position on them. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, that's very typical for the governor. I mean, the governor rarely weighs in, very rarely will weigh in on legislation that hasn't worked its way through the legislature. Very rarely. But if you look at these bills... Do you, well, do you expect him to have a position on this eventually? or do you? Oh, he, he absolutely will have to. Okay. Because if we pass the bill, he's going to have to make the decision on whether or not to pass it. Oh, but, okay. So he will yeah, have the final say in this then. Absolutely. He's got to sign it into law. But if you look at the co-sponsorship that we have there, both senators and assembly representatives, Republicans and Democrats, it is overwhelming from every part of the state who support this. So I think that's very important that we have that solidarity right now. Excuse me, when, uh, when we get this passed, and I'm very hopeful that we will be able to get it passed, it will go to the governor's desk and I'm optimistic that he'll sign it. Because one of the things that the governor has been very proud of over his seven years now as governor is that property taxes, his big selling pitch to people is that he has kept their property taxes below 2010 levels. And I think that's wonderful. I'm very proud of that too. Working with the legislature, we've been able to do that. But we've got to recognize this, is businesses, is we allow them through our law interpretations, is we allow them to draw down how their property, the values of their property, what we talked about before, the municipalities, they still have the bills to pay. They still have to provide that police and fire protection. They still have to make sure the streets are there and that they're plowed, the snow is plowed off of them, that the garbage is collected and so forth. They, their bills don't go down when, when businesses lower, fight to lower their assessments. So they have to make those up on the residential side. This is why I believe the governor will be very supportive because what we're actually fighting for here is exactly what he's fighting for, which is to make sure that property taxes remain below 2010 levels. And if we don't pass these laws, if we don't pass these changes in dark store legislation, what's going to happen moving into the future is that more and more businesses will challenge their assessments and the taxes on residential property will go up and he won't be able to make that commitment. So that's right. why I'm very, I'm very optimistic that he's going to support. I think he will be a natural ally to what we're trying to do here. Um, I hope so as well. Let's move into um, some of the shopping habits or retail model, um, you know, the ideas, possibly why some of this conversation has happened, why we're seeing, you know, situations like Marquette, Michigan and, uh, you know, other other stores, because it typically is um, from what I've been reading and I've been reading a lot about it. It's Walmart, Target, um, Lowe's, Home Depot, um, sometimes Walgreens stores. Um, hopefully CVS doesn't fall into this, but a lot of times um, these it's the big box model. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all know this. Most people like to go on to a little thing called Amazon and order, um, you know, whatever you need. So it's convenient. People really, their biz lifestyles are busy. This is what they want to be doing. Um, is it the shopping habits that are, are changing this? Do you think that's why we're seeing businesses, you know, they're, they're uh, trying to to cut back or, or why do you think this is happening? And, and, and what do you think about shopping habits and, and retail sure. models? Cause most people really 
walking through a big box store is not enjoyable and not to mention it's time consuming. So there's that as well. I mean, maybe it will change the, you know, the, the look of, of retail. So uh, it's a great question. And I've had retailers come in and talk to me about that when this bill was introduced. And they were saying, you don't know how, how tough it is out there for us. You know, we're being attacked every which way. Um, and this is to them, you know, lowering, you know, th this helps out their business model. So I guess what the way I answer that to them and to the larger question that you have um, is that these dark store bills have nothing to do with a particular business's business model or the, the demographic models in, in how people prefer to purchase goods. All we are looking to do with this is to bring certainty to the assessing process. That being said, there's no question that the landscape is changing. I think Amazon accounts for 35% of all online purchases. They have, um, I remember this, just to show my age a little bit here, I remember back in the mid 90s when uh, companies like, um, uh, like Borders and uh, what's that other, Barnes and Noble, the other bookstores, these guys were doing, I mean, going bonkers, right? And this little company called Amazon came online and they kind of competed with them. And for a while there, it was like back and forth. Well, today in 2017, Amazon's got a market capitalization of $500 billion in Barnes and Noble is less than, a, than, um, uh, than 1 billion. So 500 million actually. So you can just see how it's changed in the last 20 years and it's gone completely over. Well, I've actually heard this morning on, on the radio that Walmart is now partnering with Google and they're going to have over 100,000 items um, online to, to purchase. So, so you can, nobody you can that, tell me that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. So what we saw is a change over the last 20 years, right, is people became more comfortable purchasing online. And a lot of the, the traditional brick and mortar retailers were kind of, they weren't the only ones. I mean, the internet's changed everything. Look at your newspaper. I mean, they're still, they're struggling. They probably will be extinct in the next 10 years because you gotta find a way to adapt and become relevant. And I think when you look at what Walmart's doing in particular, they found a way now to adapt. So you're right, I, I know that they purchased jet.com. Mm -hmm. They're looking to roll out grocery delivery which I think will be huge. I just went to a local. It was a it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a Walmart or any other bigger store, but I went grocery shopping on Sunday afternoon, and this you know local company gave me a slip saying we now will do order online. You can pick up at the store. And my point in saying that is you've got businesses now who are understanding how the dynamics are changing, and. Walmart, I know, is looking to roll it out in Northeast Wisconsin too. The same thing: order online, pick up in the store. And I think they're finding there's a way there for brick and mortar retailers to connect with consumers who still want that presence. They want that ability to be able to buy online and return it right in the store. To be able to to purchase their groceries and either have them delivered or go pick them up. Um, and I think they're going to be able to compete. You know, Amazon. Who knows? You know. The whole idea that they bought Whole Foods and that they're going to corner the, the grocery market, I don't know. I see our local grocers, I see them adapting quite well to this model. So it's one of those things where absolutely the internet has sort of changed the way that, that consumers purchase products. But I think we've learned from, I think they've learned from that. I think Walmart is a perfect example, a company now that I think they have about a $250 billion cap rate. I think they're second only to Amazon, but they're changing their model with their online. I think they have almost a hundred million products online. Amazon has 250 million, but they're continuing to grow and continuing to catch up. And stores like this still have that presence right here in our communities. I can I, but can I say something about that presence? Because I believe that everything you just said points to the fact that, yes, people will be absolutely um, more likely to shop from home. And so what does that tell you? That tells you that you're going to have a bunch of empty stores. And so what's going to happen with that? And so I think what you're doing right now is really laying the groundwork for what's about to come based off of the reality of people's shopping habits. And I thank you for that. Um, we're out of time, well, but I'm going to offer you any last thoughts. 
Well, I would just say that our just for clarification, what we're doing in Dark Shores, yep. this is not this is not ending brick and mortar retail. No, it's not. Absolutely not. This is just valuing property the way it always should and could have been pro- uh, and should be valued. The changes in with the internet, those are kind of their own thing. But I will tell you, I think our brick and mortars are absolutely adapting to that, and I think you're going to find that the ones that do adapt will do just fine in the new environment. And I would agree with you, but I would add again that I believe that there's going to be some pretty large stores sitting vacant. And so I'm, again, very glad to see that this is happening to adapt to that situation as well. Um, any, any last thoughts? I appreciate you having me on and I look forward to moving this through, you know, having a hearing hopefully in the next few weeks and moving it through the legislature. So feel free to, for you and your listeners to reach out to me. I'd be happy to let you know how it's progressing. So where, where can people who are listening that maybe want to be part of that conversation, where can they, where can they reach you? Where can they get the information on the hearings? Uh, if you go online, go to Bing or go to Google and type in my name and you'll get my contact information and you'll be able to reach out. There's actually links on there that, that you can go to the legislative homepage and you can follow, you can, you can f- track these bills themselves and see how they're moving through. But otherwise my, ha- my office would be happy to assist in that. Okay. And I really do appreciate you giving, you know, a half hour of your time. I know you're very busy. We're still waiting for the budget to be passed. We'd love to see that happen. Um, and there's a lot of other things going on. So thank you so much for joining us from Madison. Appreciate it. Thank you. For show notes for this episode, go to politicalradarpulse.com slash 20. If you're watching this episode on YouTube, like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the, hit the bell. I can never say that. Hit the bell to get notifications. For more great political content, also check out Political Radar Echo. If you'd like to support the show, you can like the show on Facebook, join the Political Radar Echo community group on Facebook, and you can buy shirts and other merchandise at politicalradar.com slash shop. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching Political Radar Pulse. To ensure that you'll never miss an episode, subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. To check out more episodes of Political Radar Pulse, visit politicalradarpulse.com or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter.